Okay, welcome back. This is 1.6. So we have 1.6, 1.7, and a little bit of 1.8 to cover. So we'll finish it up here. Starting off with PES, or photoelectron spectroscopy, or like I said, PES, we'll probably call it that. Um, again, we're, uh, we, I borrowed this from online. It was free and labeled for reuse, so we're okay. Um, now, if you remember our PES, we can use those as like electron configurations. Notice how our S's, each S, is the same height because of the number of electrons in that. All right, so we can do that. 1s2, 2s2, right? And just work our way through. P is a lot taller because in this case it has six electrons, right? It has uh, six versus two, and then we've got 3s2, 3p6. So this would be 4s2 because it's the same height. If it were 4s1, remember it would probably be a little smaller peak. It would be in the same spot, but it would be a little smaller peak. All right, if we got into the D's, which would be the next one, and it was full, it would go higher up. All right, but remember, we can tell how many numbers of electrons we have based on the height of each peak. So that's a way to identify it. What we've seen is a lot of times they ask you to identify the element based on the PES. So hopefully you're able to do that. All right, rolling on, periodic trends. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this one in the fall, so hopefully we remember it. But quickly we'll go through our definitions and words. So we have ionization energy. This is the amount of energy to remove an electron. All right? We're talking about removing one electron. Most of the time we're talking about the first ionization energy, but sometimes we talk about the second, third, and so on. I think we have a question about that a little bit later. Atomic radii. This is from the inner like the nucleus to the last cloud, right? The size of it. So let's just say size. That might be better. Then we have the ionic radii. So this is the size after it's either lost or gained. And then electron affinity is the attraction, right? For an electron and then electronegativity is the ability to attract an electron once it's bonded so attracting let's say pulling an electron to itself All right, now going back and hitting the trends. All right, ionization energy tends to increase as you go to the right and up. The reason for that, what is our reasonings for that? As we move to the right, what are we adding? More protons. So we're adding more protons as we move to the right. As we move up, we have less shielding. And we could also call that effective nuclear charge is something we talked about that. All right, atomic radii, um, this increases as we go down because layers of electrons, right? And then it also increases as we go to the left, which is kind of not what we think, but it increases to the left and that's because we have less protons, so less pull. All right. Ionic radii um, are cations. Remember, cations are the positive ones, are smaller. And that's because they have a greater proton to electron uh, ratio. And our anions, which are negative, are going to be a little larger. And again, that's due to our ratio of protons to electrons. Okay? Electron affinity, as we roll through this, electron affinity increases as we go down, or increases as we go up, I apologize, and that's our less layers. And it also increases to the right, and that's because we have more protons. And the one we leave out of this is our noble gases. 
Noble gases would actually go on the other side. Noble gases are exempt. Okay, they would actually be on the other side of group one because of that full valence shell. Electronegativity, remember, this is the same one as the others, also the same reasons. And fluorine is our most electronegative element. Okay, so let's see if we can't work a few of these. So we're choosing the element with a higher first ionization energy and explaining why. So we have bromine and astatine. Bromine is number 35. Astatine is number 85. They're in the same column or the same family. So which one will have a higher first ionization energy? We're going to say bromine. And why is that? That's because it has less shielding. If we wanted to use the big kid word, we could say a uh, greater effective nuclear charge. All right, and we use bromine again, and this time we have bromine and gallium. They are in the same row, but bromine is further to the right. So we're going to say bromine, again, has a higher first ionization energy. And why is that? That is because it has more protons. All right, please do not say it's closer to a full valence shell. That would be incorrect. Okay, awesome. Let's roll on. Choosing the larger atom from each pair and explaining why. So we have Sn or Si. Sn is 10. And Si is above it. So which one's going to be larger? That's going to be Sn. And we're going to say more layers. All right, more layers of electrons. All right, now Si or chlorine. We're going to say Si is the larger one. And that's due to fewer protons, right? We have the same number of layers, but we have fewer protons, okay? Looking at O2 minus or O mi or just regular O, the larger one is going to be O2 minus, and that's because we have more electrons, right? And we actually, as we add electrons, we have a greater repulsive forces, okay? Uh, last one in that section, we have Na or Na plus. Our larger atom is going to be Na, and that's, again, that ratio, or we could even think about it with Na, we have that one extra layer of electrons. We have three energy levels, and Na1+, plus we only have two energy levels, so we could say um, more energy levels. All right. Um, now, electro electron affinities are negative, all right? So we're talking about, because it it's the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron, kind of the opposite of ionization energy, all right? Excuse me, it's the amount of energy to add an electron. So which one is going to be better, B or S? So they're in not the same row, but which one is going to be more likely to add an electron? And that's going to be S. All right, and that's because of that proton ratio. Although this one is a little tougher, it probably would have been more um, upfront to say A, L, or S because they're in the same row, because there's some weird stuff that happens when you do two rows, so they wouldn't really ask you that. All right, our last section, and then we're done with one. Uh, valence electrons and ionic compounds. Remember, an ionic compound is one that is the electrons are transferred. So we have the electrons transferred. All right, a covalent compound is where we have the electrons being shared. And just a quick review, metallic compound is bond between two metals, right? And they form a sea of electrons, right? Okay, so how do we distinguish between types of bonds? Our ionic, again, some characteristics of them, they have a high melting point. We could also say a high boiling point. Remember we talked about salt having a melting point of like 800 degrees Celsius, all right? High melting point, they tend to be structured, 
right? And we're talking about in their solids. They also tend to be solid at room temperature. All right. Um, they're usually a bond between a metal and a non-metal. And the difference in electronegativity is usually great. Depending on the book you're reading or the source, it's usually around 1.9. The difference in the electronegativities is around 1.9 or greater. All right. Our covalent ones, kind of just the opposite of those, right? They have low melting points. They tend to be liquids or gases. They are amorphous, which means without shape. If you look at them under a microscope, like sugar under a microscope is just a whole bunch of blob looking things, where salt under a microscope is all these perfect geometric shapes. This is our covalent bonds are usually between two nonmetals. And their difference in electronegativity is not very large. All right, not very large, usually less than 1.9. All right, and we'll actually cover more of that in section two. All right, that covers it. Thanks.